Welcome to Waterford Community Church. Glad that you're here with us, uh, able to worship, uh, begin our service this morning. Before we get into worship and uh, song and then the Word of God, I've got a number of announcements I want to share with you just to kind of keep you updated with everything that's going on in the church, or maybe not necessarily everything, but some of the main points, of course. Uh, The first one being that Bible studies, midweek Bible studies, uh, the ladies and the men's that happen to be on Wednesdays, a quick note about them. The men's Bible study is finished, uh, so uh, Wednesdays is, uh, is done for the men. It'll start up again in September. The ladies uh, is canceled for this week, but they'll have two more on June the 19th and 20, uh, 26th. So for those of you ladies attending, just keep that in mind. Maybe mark that on your calendar. Canceled this week, but then June 19th and 26th, it's back on. Small group Bible studies that take place on Sunday nights. Uh, for, for hours at my house, me and Stephanie's house, it's our last one tonight before the summer break. And so we have one more tonight. And then for Carl and Mary's, theirs is on tonight. And then I believe they have a barbecue next week. I believe that's correct. If you're with Carl and Mary, you um, head over to their place tonight for their last Bible study and then just double check with them about when they're going to have their kind of end of the year barbecue. I, I believe it's the following week. Um, thirdly, want to just... Um, make mention of uh, Barb Hancock. Sorry to put you on the spot, Barb, but I just, you know, Barb is actually going to be moving up north next month, and uh, we're sorry to see her go, but we also just wanted to say God bless and farewell. Uh, There's going to be a farewell luncheon for Barb on Monday, June the 17th at Harmony Bakery at 11.30 a.m. So some of the ladies have uh, put that on, and so you ladies, if you want to Um, just say farewell to Barb there at that luncheon. Again, encourage you to come and be part of that. Debbie Gibbons is kind of spearheading that. And so if you want to give her a call or a text just to let her know if you're going to be there, uh, you can find her uh, phone number in the email that Becky sends out. If you need uh, to get a hold of her and you're having trouble getting a hold of her, just let me know. Uh, But if you could RSVP to Debbie, that would be great. And again, we just want to say a a heartfelt um, farewell to Barb because uh, she's been a a very vibrant member of the church family over the last few years, and we are sorry to see her move move up north and away from us. Um, but we do pray God's blessing on your life, Barb, as you do as you do head on. A couple more a couple more things to keep in mind in the church: our baptism service is coming up uh, next week, June the sixteenth. Bring a lawn chair, bring some kind of contribution for the potluck. Uh, but again, we're just excited to be able to share in baptism. Again, that's just this coming week, uh, June the 16th, out at the Waterford Conservation Area. Uh, Come at the same time, 10.30. Maybe come a little bit early if you can, uh, just so that you can get a parking spot and get yourself set up in a nice location up there at the pavilion. So that's our baptism service coming up. If you need any more information or you're a little bit unsure as to what to expect, uh, you can just talk to me afterwards or fire me an email, and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. And then lastly, I want to just make note of our VBS program, which is going to be coming up soon, even though it seems like it's still a little ways away. It's coming up July 22nd to the 26th. And so if you're able to register your children, begin doing that, please do so. Um, There's a link that's available in the emails that Becky sends out. Uh, That VBS program is July 22nd to 26th, and it's a morning program, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. If you're able to volunteer and help us with the program in any way, again, uh, we Greatly appreciate that. If you're able to sign up, uh, let us know about your intention to do that. There's all sorts of ways to help out in the VBS program, from just supervising the kids in different groups as they go from station to station, all the way up to leading stations and uh, helping out with Bible story, craft, or song time and uh, game time. So if you're able to help in any of those ways, uh, it would be a great ministry opportunity for you to be involved in uh, here at WCC. Those are the announcements I want to share with you this morning. We're going to turn our attention now to worship and then getting into God's Word a little bit later too for the message. Uh, If you're able, please stand with me, and we are going to devote this time to the Lord by going to Him in prayer. So let's bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, and we just pause, and we want to just uh, settle our hearts before you turning our attention to you, recognizing your sovereign power and grace in our lives, uh, that you have saved us, rescued us from the dominion of sin, and transferred us into your kingdom 
uh, and uh, you've done so through the work of Jesus. And so we are grateful and thankful for everything you've done in us and through us. We thank you for the many blessings that you bestow on us as well um, on a daily basis, Lord. We are here this morning not only to sing your praises for the great gift of salvation, but for the way you sustain us and keep us day in and day out. We thank you, Father, for how you've uh, led us and how you grow us in your spirit and in the knowledge of your son, Jesus. Father, we do pray that as we worship and honor you this morning, our hearts would be refreshed on your truth uh, so that we might uh, be able to better glorify you and honor you in the days ahead in this upcoming week. We also, Father, do want to pray just a special um, prayer of protection and blessing on Barb as um, she begins the process of moving and then leaving uh, next month. Father, would you just um, have your spirit of peace and comfort upon her as this big change is about to occur in her life. Father, help her to be able to make good friendships and connections up north where she moves. Help her to find a good, godly, Bible-believing church that she can plug into and be connected with and, again, enjoy the fellowship and worship that she's enjoyed with us here at WCC. So we do pray your, your care and protection on her as we uh, are saddened to see her go, but believe that it is in your will and that you will uh, keep her as she does go. Father, as we worship you now, as our hearts turn to glorify your name, we pray that we'd be prepared, that we would do so with sincerity and honesty, uh, and that you'd be glorified in everything that's said and done in this worship service. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thousands 
this morning church family the next song we're going to sing together is a song called is he worthy and it's taken from revelation chapter 5 and if you can remember that passage it's a vision that john's brought to and he sees he's in the heavenly places and there's these scrolls that need to be opened but no one that he can see is worthy to open those scrolls but then they say hold on a minute there is one who can that's the one who laid his life down for the world 
let's not forget, church family, that it is Christ and Christ alone who is worthy of all things. Let's sing the songs of praise, but also remembrance of what he's done for us. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is, is a new creation coming, it is, is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst, it is, is it good that we remind ourselves of this, it is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Of all blessing and honor and glory, is he worthy of this? Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does, and does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slain. From every people and tribe, every nation and tongue. The kingdom and praise to God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Uh, As we sing one more song in preparation for the message this morning, the song that recalls to mind that there is one gospel where hope is found. The empty tomb still speaks, and it's the gospel that Jesus Christ has given his self for us. 
so that we can have eternal life. And it is a un unifying thing to have that there is one gospel, but it's also a dividing thing. It's clear and concise. This is the only way that we gain eternal life, and it's through Jesus Christ our Lord. So let's sing a song as a praise to him this morning. seated. We'll have our kids video at this time. The walls around Jerusalem were finished at last. With God's help, the people finished rebuilding the walls and the city gates in just 52 days. Ezra, 
a priest and scribe, had traveled from Babylon to Jerusalem with a group of God's people. God was with Ezra, and Ezra wanted to study God's law, obey it, and teach it to God's people. Ezra met with some of the people of Israel. He learned that some of the people and their leaders had disobeyed God, ignoring his word. Ezra tore his clothes, and he pulled out some of his hair. He sat down and was very upset. Ezra got on his knees and he prayed to God, confessing the people's sin. As he did this, God's people began to gather around him. They cried too and offered sacrifices, promising to be faithful to God. Several years later, the people in Jerusalem gathered together early in the morning at one of Jerusalem's gates. Men, women, and children, anyone who could understand, came to listen to the reading of God's word. As the sun was just coming up, Ezra brought out the book of the law of Moses that God had given to his people. God's words were written on a scroll. Ezra stood on a high wooden platform and began to read. Ezra read the law for hours, and all the people listened carefully. The people stood up. They had respect for God's word. Ezra praised God, and the people lifted up their hands. Amen, amen, they said. The people in the crowd bowed down with their faces to the ground, and they worshipped God. Some of the leaders there, the Levites, explained the law to the people and helped them understand the words Ezra read. As the people heard the words of the law, they began to cry. The law was God's rules for living, and the people had disobeyed God. They realized they had sinned. Ezra, the Levites, and Nehemiah, the governor, said, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not be sad or cry. Even though the people's sin made them sad, this was a happy day. Then Ezra said to them, Go home and prepare a feast. Eat rich food and drink sweet drinks. Share what you have prepared with those who have nothing prepared. The people obeyed Ezra. They prepared a feast. They were glad because they understood the words of the law that were explained to them. God's word is powerful. When Ezra read God's word, the people loved God more and changed their ways. The Bible says that Jesus is the word. Jesus is God who came to live with people on earth. Jesus has the power to change our hearts. All right, at this time, the kids can be dismissed for junior church. And we are going to get into God's word uh, ourselves here. Uh, but before we do, why don't we bow in a word of prayer and we'll commit this time to the Lord and then we'll get into his word together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, as we come before you this morning, uh, we again just thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the wonderful truths that we've been able to sing and, and hear about uh, the grace and goodness that you've bestowed upon us through Christ and the new life that you've given us. Father, uh, we could not be more grateful or thankful. But as we open up your word now, our hearts and minds turn to your instruction, uh, what you have to say for us and about us, uh, that we might live in accordance with your will. So help us to have ears to hear. Uh, Lord, would you just prepare our hearts so that uh, we wouldn't be standing in the way of what you have to say to us, uh, but that we would receive it, that we would uh, willingly take what you have to say and seek to apply it to our lives and live for you today and in the days to come. We pray this all. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open them up to the book of Ephesians. As we enter into Ephesians chapter 6, the final chapter in our study of the book of Ephesians, uh, those of you who have been with us, uh, at least since the beginning of the year, you know that we've been studying the book of Ephesians, and uh, we are now getting towards the end of it and the conclusion of the book as we get into Ephesians chapter 6. And again, those of you who have been with us for a long time, but for the sake of those who haven't, Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3 kind of make up the first half of the book, and those first three chapters deal primarily with some of the deeper theological truths of the gospel. Uh, who is Jesus? What has He done for us? How has He saved us? What kind of new life has He given to us? And then chapters 4, 5, and 6 has to do with how we are to respond and live for Him. So the beginning of chapter 4, we are given this great kind of 
uh, change or uh, movement in the book that goes from, okay, you already know now what the truth of the gospel is. Now, here's how you're going to live it out. So, chapter 4 begins with, therefore. Therefore, in light of all this great truth about what God has done for you, the Bible is now going to urge us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which God's called us, to live our life in a way that reflects the truth that we've learned in those first three chapters of the book of Ephesians. So, as citizens of a new kingdom, as citizens of a heavenly kingdom, we're to walk in a manner worthy of Christ. This walk involves living a Christ-honoring life that infects all areas of our lives, but then particularly now as we've been looking last week and this week at how walking in a manner worthy is meant to take place in all aspects of our relationships. Now, the book of Ephesians isn't going to touch on every single kind of relationship that you could potentially have in life, but it does, it does touch on three uh, significant ones, especially for the people in the first century in the ancient world. Now, for us, this might look a little bit different in our lives. In fact, in some cases, it may look a lot different. But the principles of the Word of God remain the same, and so we're meant to understand this instruction is for us today as much as it was for them in the first century. The big point in the big picture, of course, is that we would see how God uh, has given us a radically new life, and that life is meant to be lived out in specific ways with the people who we have in, we're in relationship with. So last week we talked about the marriage relationship, about how the Christian ought to live in that life, in that relationship. Um, this morning we're going to look at children and parents, and then a little bit later, servants and masters. And again, some of these very specific historical truths are not necessarily going to be as easy to understand and apply in our own personal lives. And we're going to see what I mean by that once we come down to servants and masters. But what's important for us to see this morning is the big picture. What is God trying to communicate to us through His Word about how we live in light of these different relationships that we find ourselves in? So the early Christians, they did not seek to live their lives in the same way as the culture in the world around them would. And the Roman culture had a specific way of doing things in the family, in their employment, with slaves and masters. The Christian was to live differently. Instead, the Christian was to seek to live counterculturally as redeemed children of God. And this is what I think Ephesians chapter 5 and 6 are helping us understand now. So let's look at what the Bible has to say. If you have your Bible open there to Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to begin reading verses 1 on through verse 9. And you can look on the screen ahead as well, reading out of the English Standard Version. So the Word of God says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bondservants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he's a bondservant or free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both master and yours is in heaven. Sorry, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. All right, so we have these different relationships. Again, in the ancient world, these would have been some of the most common relationships within the everyday life of the Christian. This is why the Apostle Paul is highlighting them specifically. Uh, for us, we might find ourselves in different kinds of relationships. I know, for instance, you know, the servant-master relationship is probably not one that we specifically relate to here in this day and age, but I hope that we're going to be able to see some important transferable principles between the two. I think virtually everyone, though, can relate to the first one that we talk about here in chapter 6, children and parents, and then specifically children and fathers, because everyone is a child to someone, right? Uh, maybe your parents have passed on, but at some point in life, you, you had parents or have parents or have someone that you relate to as parent, father, and so this kind of relationship, I think, is almost virtually universally relatable 
And so an important one for us to cover, and this is in fact where we'll spend the bulk of our time. So children as they relate to their parents and then their parents and fathers specifically as they relate to their children. So the text begins by saying, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Now this is one of the few times in all of the Bible that the scripture specifically addresses the children. There are a few other occasions when this happens in the New Testament, but this is one of the few times when specific instruction is actually given directly to children. And yes, it could have been adult children in the congregation that the Apostle Paul was talking to, but it seems quite likely that who he's talking to are actually young little children who are living still in the households of their parents because if they weren't living in the household of their parents, if they had grown up, married, and moved on, it's hard to understand then how they might obey this command of obedience. Like, not just simply the rule of honor or respect, but the rule and instruction of obedience, specific obedience. So I think this is really interesting and, in fact, important to see that the Apostle Paul, the Bible here, is speaking to children. This morning, those of you who are children living in the household of your parents, yes, you young ones, you know, grade four and upwards in the high school as well, this is the kind of message that is directed specifically to you. But then, of course, for those of you who are adult children, there is still an important lesson, there's still an important message for us to know how to walk in a manner worthy towards um, our parents, even though we're adults, even though we've moved on, moved out, and we're maybe, maybe married and have children of our own, how are we as adult children going to relate and honor and respect our parents as well? So then, firstly, as the Word is speaking specifically to those children who are living under the authority and household of their parents, the first command is obey. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Again, the word for obey it has to do not just with listening or hearing what your parents have to say, but seeking to actually do the instruction that they give you, to follow through with it. If they tell you to do something, then I'm going to do it. This is the simplest and I think most obvious way to understand that word obedience. And I think it's the right way to understand that word obedience. It's a direct command. And then the Apostle Paul links it to that Old Testament commandment from the Ten Commandments, so in verse 2, he says, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. Honoring your father and mother was an incredibly important command, not just in the first century, but going all the way back into the Old Testament. It was one of the foundational building blocks of the community of the people of Israel, that the family would be a structure on which the culture was built. And so children honoring and respecting their parents was an incredibly important aspect of living life in the community of Israel. Now, as the people of Israel kind of, you know, they are taken into captivity and then brought back into their land, and then Christ comes on the scene so many generations later, and now we find God's people are spread out amongst churches, not just in Israel, but across the world and all sorts of other kinds of cultures, like here in Ephesus, um, a, a Greco-Roman world that was influenced by many other different pagan gods and cultures and systems and ways of doing li life that would have even been foreign to the Israelite person. This rule then and this command to obey your parents, the Apostle Paul is hearkening the, the people back to those foundational truths that were originally given to the people of Israel going all the way back to the Old Testament. And he's saying that rule wasn't just a cultural thing. It wasn't just for Israel. This is one of the foundational things that God has built uh, His creation on, the institution of family, and that culture would flourish and, and grow out from the foundation of the family. So children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. As the text says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, that phrase, in the Lord, is modifying the word obedience. And understand, it's not modifying the word parent. And that's an important distinction because the Bible then is saying, obey as to the Lord, your parents. Not obey your parents who are in the Lord. See, that, that's a much different thing, right? Like, if the Bible says, obey your parents who are in the Lord, that kind of gives us the loophole of, well, I don't have to obey them if they're not Christians then, Right? I can, I can kind of just do my own thing and forget about them and disrespect them. Well, no, the Bible's not saying that. 
It's saying, obey them. And your obedience to them is to be as to the Lord. So the way in which you obey is meant to honor God Himself and honor Christ. So the command comes then with a promise, which is perhaps maybe if you're just reading this for the first time this morning, probably the most perplexing thing out of that whole command. I mean, children obeying your parents probably seems like a pretty straightforward command and one that we would hope to be followed by, by Christians, especially those in the church here, right? But then this strange, well, this is a command that comes with a promise. What does that have to do with uh, walking in a manner worthy of the call? Well, this again harkens all the way back to the Old Testament. So in your Bible there, look where it says, honor your father and mother, in verse 2, this is the first command with a promise. And the Apostle Paul explains what that promise is, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Again, hearkening back to that Old Testament experience of Israel. You're given a promised land. Now here are the Ten Commandments to live out. If you obey your mother and father, if you honor your mother and father, God is going to bestow blessing on you and your life is going to flourish in the land of promise. Now understand then, the Apostle Paul is seeking to apply that promise to the church age. We don't live in Israel, so clearly that, that promise isn't being lived out in the land of Israel for us. But the promise nonetheless is important. The Bible's telling us, honor your father and mother, and in doing so, God is going to bestow blessing upon you. There's a promise of reward that comes afterwards. And what does that mean? Does that mean if I obey my father and my mother, if I honor my father and mother, my life is going to be easy? Well, maybe for some people it would be a little bit easier if they just did what they were told, but that's not necessarily what the text means specifically. So when the Bible says, honor your father and mother, and then it will go well with you in the land, going well doesn't necessarily mean just an easy life. And I think this is most obviously understood when you examine what happened to Christians back in the ancient world? They were persecuted, insulted, mocked, imprisoned, and even killed for their faith. So honoring your father and mother doesn't come with just an easy life all of a sudden. It's not as if honoring our father and mother is just going to make life all the much more comfortable for us moving forward, especially if we live in a world that's hostile to the Christian faith. So when the Bible gives us this promise that if you honor your father and mother, it's going to go well with you in the land, what the Bible is explaining to us is God Himself is going to show us favor in life, not only in this life, but the life to come. The person who understands how to honor their father and mother properly understands something about what it means to honor God Himself. And that kind of person knows the love of God, knows what it means to submit to the will of God, knows what it means to follow God and to be a person of respect and integrity in their life as they seek to honor their parents as well. And so what the Bible is reminding us is that that kind of person is the kind of person that God reveals Himself to, the kind of person who's following in the will of God, and that God is going to bring them into eternal life, because they almost certainly then have a knowledge of God and faith in Jesus Christ. So that promise, or sorry, that command comes with the promise that God is going to bestow this kind of eternal blessing. But I think there's also a sense in which we understand the promise in this earthly temporal sense as well. So for instance, I think what the Bible's doing in part here is revealing to us wisdom. The promise that reminds us of the wisdom of honoring our father and mother. That typically someone who's able to honor their father and mother is able to also extend that honor and respect to other aspects of their life. See, the mother and father in your life, the parent relationship in your life, is like the first experience of authority that you ever come into contact with. You know this authority from the moment of your birth up into childhood and on into teenage years, into adulthood. This is the very first kind of authority that you ever come up against you ever interact with. It's a God-ordained institution and authority, so it's a good authority overall, but it's the very first one you ever have any interaction with. It's the most basic one. And so I think what the Bible's doing is it's reminding us that if we as people 
fail or cannot honor our father and mother, how are we going to honor any other authoritative institution in our world? We won't. Yeah, that's, my, that's my understanding. That's my observation. That's my belief. And that's even my own anecdotal experience in my own life. That the person then who experiences great rebellion, discord, and adversity towards their parents is almost certainly never going to be able to experience a kind of submission, mutual respect and honor in other relationships or authoritative ones for that matter as well. So then the very basic institution of parent and children, if, par if, if children are able to express that honor and respect towards their parents, it's almost certainly going to follow them into every other aspect of life. So the opposite then is true, right? Like if I'm able to be, you know, to honor my father and mother, show them honor, show them respect, listen and obey them even as a child, it's almost certain that as I go out into life, I'm going to be able to do that in the other institutions that I bump up against. Like as I take employment somewhere, I'm going to remember the kind of respect and honor I had with my parents, and I'm going to extend that into my employer situation. It's going to be true in my marriage life. It's going to be true with my children. It's going to be true with my church life. Like if a person doesn't know how to honor and respect their parent, how are they going to honor and respect an employer? How are they going to honor and respect church leadership and discipline there? It's almost certainly not going to happen. If I can't do it at the basic level of family, I'm almost certainly never going to do it at any other level either. And so I think what the Bible's doing then, when it reveals to us this promise, going back to the promise, if you honor your father and mother, it will go well with you in the land. I think what the Bible's doing is it's reminding us of the very real, applicable, relatable, tangible outcomes of life. When you learn to honor your father and mother, that blessing and that privilege is going to go with you into your other relationships as you grow and move on in life. And that's going to be a huge blessing to you. That is going to be a, an incredible um, asset to you as you move on into life. That's an aspect of wisdom to live by that way of, of life so that with your employer, with your church family, with other relationships, people in your neighborhood that you live by and do life with, you're going to be able to extend a level of respect and honor to them as well. And that is going to have a reciprocating effect in your life. It's going to come back to you and it's going to make for a better life. I believe that's what the Bible's saying. Again, this is not necessarily a universal formula that you can just kind of put out there and, well, God, I honored my father and mother. Now everything's supposed to be good, right? Not necessarily. That's not the way biblical wisdom works. But wisdom reminds us that generally speaking, if I'm able to do this thing over here, this result over here will follow. So not only is the Bible saying that honor your father and mother and God bestows blessing, even eternal blessing on you, Honor your father and mother, and that is going to go well with you in every other aspect of life. This is a wisdom principle that the Bible is reminding us of. So children, both young and adult, they're meant to respect the wisdom and guidance of their parents. Question, what about not-so-great parents? What about parents who want nothing to do with the faith? Or what about parents who are actually cruel and demeaning or abusive, perhaps, even, to their children. I can understand how a topic like this could be incredibly sensitive and difficult for someone who's had that experience in their life to be able to just hear these words, obey your parents in the Lord. Well, what about my parents, Pastor? What about, what about the way I was treated as a kid? Certainly they don't deserve the honor and respect of anybody for what they did to me. What about parents who have not been good? Well, interestingly, there are cases in the Old and New Testament, but also there's historic record from early church history that's been given to us about situations just like that. Uh, Augustine, one of the early church fathers back, back in the third century, he records, he recorded a lot of things for us from the, from the early church. But one of the things he recorded was the martyrdom of this uh, young lady by the name of Perpetua. And this young lady living in the third century was, was dragged before the courts for being a Christian. And she was being accused 
of denying all the other gods and how disrespectful and dishonoring that was. And she was going to be imprisoned and then likely killed. And so she was brought before the courts and she was told, recant of your faith. Give up your Christian loyalty and burn incense to these other gods. Uh, you're, you're a Roman. This is who you are. You, you belong to the pagan gods, not to the Christian god. She was told to recant. And she refused. But you know what's interesting about this story that Augustine records for us? Perpetua's father was there in court. And his father was a good pagan citizen. And so his father was pleading in court, pleading with Perpetua to recant her faith. Just deny it. Just burn the incense. You're bringing shame upon yourself, shame upon your family, shame upon me. Honor your father and mother. Recant your faith now and follow us. Augustine records that Perpetua would not do this. And some might say, well, didn't she dishonor her father and mother then? Well, the Word of God reminds us, of course, that this kind of obedience is not meant to be blind obedience, not blind faith in our parents. If our parents are calling us to do things that go against the Word of God, that would cause disloyalty to the name of Jesus or profane the name of our God, then of course we're not supposed to listen to that. So Augustine goes on to record about Perpetua that she was being tempted by the devil himself, that the devil was using her father of all people to draw her away from the faith. But she refused to listen because her loyalty was ultimately to her heavenly father, not her earthly father. So, of course, we are meant to understand the Word of God with these nuances. If our parents are seeking to lead us away from the Lord, then our loyalty is to Him first. But again, the general rule and principle of life, according to the Bible, and hopefully, ideally, our parents are good parents, even if they aren't Christians, at least they might be giving us good advice, solid guidance, and supporting us well. But if they are believers, and ideally they are, then they're able to give us guidance in the Lord, and we are called then to obedience, submitting to their guidance and leadership and honoring what our parents say to us. Our ultimate loyalty is to God. And so if our parents lead us astray from that, of course, we must clearly refuse. However, the Christian must seek to do everything in their power to honor their parents. This is in keeping with God's will. So young people, especially you young people here this morning, this question is for you. How are you honoring your mother and your father? There's a great blessing that God has for you in His Word as you do so. For those of you and those of us who are adult children towards our parents, how are you, how, how am I honoring our parents as well? Because as adult children, we're still called to honor as well, we, we might not have this very specific authority of obedience over top of us, but we must honor still, even as adult children. So then the Bible moves on from children to fathers. So children obey your parents in the Lord, but then verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So children are given this great command. But then ideally, fathers, parents would be able to live in this command from verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Now, to provoke someone to anger is to enrage them or exasperate a situation, to irritate or antagonize someone towards anger. This is, of course, completely counterproductive, not to mention cruel, to the task of teaching our children in the discipline and self-control and godliness of, uh, of our Heavenly Father. Exasperating them and irritating them and enraging them, provoking them to anger, actually defies the principles of the character they're meant to grow in. Not grow in anger, not grow in irritation, not grow in frustration, but grow in the discipline and fear of the Lord. So, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. This happens in also many kinds of ways, subtle ways, passive-aggressive ways. It can be very easy to fall into the temptation of just simply threatening or in our own frustration and anger, then trying to give it back to our children 
and making them feel the way I felt initially. But the Bible calls us, do not enrage, do not exasperate, do not irritate, antagonize, do not provoke to anger. What is the call of the Father? The Bible spells it out very clearly and simply in one phrase. Bring them up in the discipline of and the instruction of the Lord. Fathers, I mean, it's not Father's Day. It would have been cool if this fell right on Father's Day, right? But it doesn't. Fathers, if you wanted one of the most concise, straightforward, simple explanations of your calling in life, this is your verse. This is our verse. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. When the Bible says discipline, This is a kind of training, training in how to live according to God's ways. Think about that that weight room, going to train your body, your muscles. Think about that long distance endurance training that runners go through. You go out and you put the time and effort into actually training for something. This is the image that the Bible's giving us. Fathers, as it says, discipline your children. Again, the English word discipline might cause in our minds this image of um, maybe corporal punishment or giving timeouts, uh, punishing, taking things away, that kind of discipline. But that's actually not what the original language means. And the English word discipline can be a little bit, um, maybe cause a little bit of a misunderstanding in this regard. Because that word for discipline in the original language, it has to do with you as a father training your children to do a task. This would be a very common, common thing back in the ancient world for a father to take their son and train them in um, the career that the father was in. They were a carpenter. They would apprentice with their father. You would train them to be a carpenter. They were a sculptor. They were a business person selling things in the market. If they were in agriculture... You would apprentice your son, you would apprentice your daughter in whatever work it was that you were doing. You would train them in that work. That was your job. The Bible gives new meaning to that idea of training the young people in your family, your children. The father is meant to not just train for a career. The father is to train the children in the fear, the discipline, and the godliness that the Word of God shows us. Bring them up in the training of God's ways. And then this other word, instruction. The discipline and instruction of the Lord. Instruction is, in a very simple sense, teaching. The the verbal, informative teaching of God's way. With a special emphasis. Again, the English word instruction is not big enough. But the original language helps us understand not just verbally teaching them God's ways, but being attentive to correction. So when we see our children doing something that defies the will of God, goes against the will of God, the father then steps in to say, remember your teaching. Remember, this goes against what God's ways say. If I catch my child lying, I don't just tell them, don't do that. According to the word of God, I meant to teach them. In other words, correct them, say, but God doesn't want us to lie. There are good reasons for not lying. God is truth. God is a God of integrity and honesty. This is the kind of example that we're supposed to have, so you shouldn't lie. So teaching, that word instruction has not only to do with the verbal teaching of our children, but being able to correct them when when we see them do something wrong. Again, I think in our culture, this relationship, children towards parents, parents towards children, it gets all mixed up and messed up in all sorts of extreme ways. Like, for instance, um, in our culture, we see this extreme example of abusing authority in the household. And sadly, we see this play out in all sorts of terrifying, horrific ways in the family structure where children are manipulated, abused, uh, not nurtured and grown in the way that God wants them to. But then we also see in the household, in our day and age, children that are ruling the roost, so to speak. They get away with whatever they want, and the parent just kind of passively stands by, well, I want to be careful. I don't want to tell them what to do. I don't want to instruct them in any way, because that might kind of further the gap between us. That might push them away too much. 
Those two extremes are completely antithetical to what the Bible is teaching. Of course, we ought not to abuse the authority that God gives us, but we ought not to stand by passively either and do nothing while we see our children stumbling in the dark. The Bible shows us a picture then of children respectfully honoring and listening to their parents. And then the parent, the father specifically, taking on this role of discipline and instruction. God designed then this community, fatherhood and children, for this purpose of training and instruction, training children in the ways of God, in His holiness and His righteousness. Now you might be thinking, well, why didn't the Apostle Paul here talk to mothers? He could have very easily said fathers and mothers, and I think the Bible could have done that. There would have been nothing wrong with that, I don't think. I think one of the main reasons the Apostle Paul centers out fathers is not because fathers necessarily did more training and instruction than, than mothers. There's a lot of good evidence in the early church, going all the way back even into Judaism, into the Old Testament, uh, and then even the Greco-Roman culture, where fathers and mothers played both a crucial role in training and instructing and teaching and the education of their children. So it's not as if one is being played against the other here, but what I believe is happening here is especially in the first century, in that culture, the father had a legal right over his household. The father was viewed culturally as really that patriarch, really the owner of the household. He was the leader, the head honcho, the wife did what he said, the children did what he said, and that was the order of things in culture. So the Apostle Paul is centering out fathers because he knows out of anyone, if anyone's going to abuse their authority, it's going to be the fathers. So fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Don't rule over them harshly. Don't lead them in that way. Care for them, honor them, respect them, uh, grow them, nurture them. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So this is why I think mothers are not necessarily specifically mentioned here, although I think the principles of discipline and, uh, and instruction apply to mothers as well. I just think fathers, especially in the first century, had the temptation of abusing that role. I think today, in this day and age, a similar thing happens. Not so much the abusing of the role as abdicating the role, not living in it at all. Fathers. Are we teaching our children? Are we instructing them? Are we disciplining them in the ways of Christ? You cannot teach what you do not know. If you do not know Christ, if you do not know His Word, you cannot teach your children that. You cannot train what you have not done as well. You do not go to someone who does not know how to run a marathon and ask them to teach you how to run a marathon. You go to someone who's done it before. You go to someone who's experienced the pain, the body convulsions, what to do, how to think, the psychology behind it. That's the person you get to train you, someone who's been there and done it. Our children need a father, need parents who know the ways of Christ, who've been there, who have done it, who have experienced failure, who have experienced temptation, who have experienced the grace and redemptive power of God in order to communicate those truths to the children as well. So fathers, you cannot teach what you do not know. You cannot train what you have not done. Our children need a father who has a knowledge of God's word and an ability to exemplify it. Children, obey your parents. Fathers, bring your children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. But now on... Now on to bond servants and ser- servants and masters. It says in verse 6, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Bond servants. In some of your English Bibles, it probably says slaves, just plainly. Slaves, obey your earthly masters. And other English translations, it might just simply say servants, obey your masters. And the variance in that translation is because the original word that's used in Greek, doulos, can be translated in a bunch of different ways. And to help us understand a little bit about what's going on then, it's important to know that slavery in the ancient world didn't just look 
the way we commonly understand it, knowing our past history. See, what's closest to us in our history is how Canada and the U.S. was formed and how in the history of Canada and the U.S. and predominantly the U.S., there is this black mark of racism and slavery that dominates the historical record where men were owning and possessing other men and women and children. That kind of possession slavery, ownership slavery, is what dominates our mind. So it's important to understand that back in the biblical times, in the early church, there's a couple different kinds of servitude as slavery that the Bible kind of describes. First of all, yes, there was that category of slavery where people were taken against their will and owned as possessions. But then there's other categories of slavery, and this is why in some cases the Bible translates this word doulos as just servant or bond servant. In other places, it's more clearly slavery. So the Bible is going to use a more strong word like that. But in the ancient world, there's this other category of um, indentured servitude where you might bond yourself to another person or family. And we get this word bond servant from that. This idea of bonding yourself to another person or family was this idea that, yes, I was working for them and my whole life was kind of given to them, but it was done for certain reasons. I wasn't taken against my will. Uh, I wasn't owned by those masters. But there may have been a couple of different reasons, especially in the ancient world, you would bond yourself to another person in this kind of servitude. And you might even call yourself a doulos, a servant, a bond servant, or you might even take on the title of a slave. And there's all sorts of reasons why you would do this in the ancient world. One of them would just be necessity. Maybe you have an incredibly high debt that you have no way of paying. Even after you've sold all of your material possessions, you have no way of paying this person back, so you serve them. You go into their household and you serve them for as long as you can until your debt is repaid. That would be a form of bonding yourself as a servant or slave to that person. You would do so out of necessity. There's no other option. You can't claim bankruptcy in the ancient world. They just either kill you or you serve that person for the rest of your life. It's not like today we have certain infrastructure in place where people can be protected in different ways. You might have to just serve that person out of necessity. But then you might bond yourself to another person out of convenience. Like you might be leaving the household that you grew up in and you might realize there, there really isn't any options for me. I grew up in a poor, the lowest point of society. Uh, I, I don't have a position of, of wealth. I, I'm not going to be able to make money. Uh, maybe there's just no market for the skills my father passed on to me. And you're realizing as time goes on, for convenience sake, I might have to bond myself to a family and serve them. So this kind of servitude, this kind of slavery happened in the Old Testament. It happens today as well in different places, but we don't typically see it. It's not as obvious and visible in Canada or the U.S. But these were the categories or types of slavery that happened in the, in the Old and New Testament. It's important to recognize how that is a little different than what our minds will initially perceive when we read the word slavery. We often just think about ownership and somebody taking someone against their will to possess them. That wasn't the only kind of thing the Bible talks about. But here in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul doesn't specify what kind of slavery he's talking about. And I think that's an important thing to note. The reason he doesn't specify, I think, is because these principles are meant to apply broadly to anyone who finds themselves as a servant to another person whether it's forced labor or whether it's out of necessity or convenience, whatever situation you find yourself in as a servant, these words apply to you. So bond servants, obey your earthly masters. Again, interestingly, that, interesting that Paul says earthly masters. He's being absolutely clear. Yes, the ones who are ruling over you. 
Obey them with a sincere heart as you would to Christ. Again, not in a way that says your, your master is not Christ. They, they do not take his place. They do not rule over you like a Lord, like Christ. But your obedience to them is meant to reflect your obedience to Christ as well. So as servants of Christ, you're serving them as a reflection of your ultimate servant, uh, servitude to Jesus himself. And in honoring your earthly master then, you're honoring Christ himself. The Bible says, serve them with sincerity. At the end of verse 6, it says, as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. It might be difficult for a bondservant or a slave, especially if they have a cruel master, to seek to sincerely serve this person who is maybe belittling them or hurting and harming them. So that person who reads these words from the Apostle Paul from the Bible might think, how am I ever going to serve my master with sincerity? Well, the Bible reminds them that serve them as you would serve Christ. Treat them as you would treat Christ. They may not deserve it, but the Bible's calling you to this radical, different way of living. See, back in the ancient world, slaves and servants were typically looked on as lazy individuals. For the most part, that was a perception and a stereotype that was perpetuated in the ancient world. So again, the Apostle Paul's reminding those earthly slaves, those servants, Serve in such a way that looks different than the world around you. There are going to be so many of your other fellow servants that are being lazy, uh, maybe mocking and ridiculing their master behind their back. You as Christians are not to serve in such a way. Serve with sincerity, serve as to Christ. And then a promise is given to them as well, just as the children. It says in verse 8, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this you will receive back from the Lord, whether he's a bondservant or free. The promise is that God will reward, whether a servant or free person, God will reward the good that a person shows to another individual. Again, we don't know exactly how God is going to do this, whether it happens in this life or the next. The promise of God's word is, again, the general principle of wisdom is if you show goodness and kindness to others, that goodness and kindness tends to to follow you back. Furthermore, the Bible reminds us that God seeks to reward people who do His will. So as we seek to do God's will, God seeks to honor and reward us. You might be asking, well, how do we apply something like this to our lives? Something that seems so foreign to our culture, like slavery. And I certainly don't want to say that Ancient slavery is in any way comparable to the life we live today with all the freedoms we have in Canada. But I do think there's some transferable principles and there are some similarities of experience that we can draw from. First of all, we may find ourselves in environments of adversity and even subordination in life. See, the world around us oftentimes seeks to dominate. People in power seek to dominate those under them. We see this in all sorts of different aspects of life. There are societal hierarchies in our world that we interact with. Our government, employment, and in school. Again, for you young people, you're going to school. If, if you've ever experienced some kind of power struggle in the government, if you've ever experienced some kind of power um, distortion in your workplace, or if you've ever experienced uh, a bad teacher, or principal who's kind of going out of their way to make your life miserable. You've experienced to some way, to some degree, some of the principles that the Apostle Paul is talking about here. When and if you find yourself in this subordinate position of being below somebody, somebody exerting power and dominance over you, these are the Christian principles that the Bible calls us to exemplify. The Christian then is called to exercise meekness, sincerity, integrity, and serving others as they would the Lord. Think about that question. Your employer who is exerting dominance over you, how would you treat them if it was Jesus himself? 
Think about, again, those of you young people in schools, in school settings. You have a teacher or a principal who's exerting some kind of dominance in an unhelpful way in the classroom. How am I supposed to respond to that? How would you respond to Christ? How would you show honor and respect to Him? These are the kind of questions I think the Bible is drawing out of us. While we may not be able to relate perfectly to this kind of slavery situation that the Bible describes here, there are aspects of principles that are transferable to us. When we find ourselves in this power struggle, and we will in the world we live in, how are we going to respond to someone who's exerting this power over us? And then finally, the Bible speaks to masters. And the Bible says there finally in verse 9, Masters do the same to them. Stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, that there's no partiality with him. Do the same to them. In other words, carry out your duty as a master as you would to the Lord. Honor the Lord in carrying out your responsibilities. This is a call for those earthly masters to exercise responsibility and care towards the servants in their households. To stop threatening, to stop using the threat of abuse and cruel treatment as a way to dominate the people under you, but instead, because Christ is your master and theirs, treat those people under you with respect. Because you're the same in God's eyes, He shows no partiality, He's going to judge you just the same as He's going to judge those under you. You are to see them as created equal in God's eyes. So stop treating them with disdain and instead honor them, care for them. You have a responsibility over them to help them thrive in the life that they have, even if it is a menial one at that. So again, there's no one-to-one comparison for us since in Canada there's certainly no slavery No masters owning other people, but there are larger principles to put into practice here. For those of you who do find yourself in management situations, for those of you who have people that you are in authority over, an important question the Bible may be drawing out of you is, how do you treat those people who you are in authority over? The Christian is called to show care and concern for any subordinates, and to recognize the equality they possess before God. So then, these different relationships, children, parents, parents to children, earthly servants to earthly masters, masters to servants. What's the big picture here? I'm going to close with this. What can happen when we go over all of these details is sometimes... We just hear a lot of rules. We just hear a lot of instructions. It's important to kind of refocus then, what is the big picture of these nine verses? Ephesians 6 verses 1 to 9 instructs us to bring honor and respect into the common relationships of our everyday life. The Bible's reminding us, whether it's with the earthly relationship of parents and children, employers, even those with our government, in the school, the classroom, whether it's employment as a manager over their subordinates, the Bible is instructing us to bring honor and respect into the common earthly relationships that we have in life. Why? Why should we care about this? Well, why should children honor their parents and servants honor their earthly masters? Well, because I'm going to honor those who are in authority over me as a symbol of my honor to Christ. As a Christian, I'm going to show honor to people who are in authority over me so that the ultimate authority and honor might go to Jesus himself. Why should fathers care for their children and earthly masters for their servants? Again, as a symbol of the care and love that my heavenly father and my heavenly ruler has for me. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling of Christ. The worthy walk reflects Christ in every relationship of life. 
You and I are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. I live then not by the rules and the expectations of this world, but by those instituted by the King and Lord over all. Children, how are you honoring your parents? Fathers, how are you caring for your children? Those in positions of subordination, how are you responding to those over you in authority? And those of you who have authority over other people, how are you responding to those under you in your care? Walk in a manner that reflects Christ. Heavenly Father, as we think on these many truths and practical truths, Father, help us to see how we are meant to reflect Christ in our lives. Father, there are so many, so many things that life throws at us. There are so many challenges, problems, and issues. Our world is, is not a simple place. Thankfully, your word has given us many, many practical tools to be able to honor you in every single one of those aspects of life. So, Father, help us to heed your word. Help us to receive it as divine instruction from you. Help us to honor you in our lives as we walk in a manner worthy of the call of Christ. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing in closing, Be Thou My Vision. Heavenly Father, as we go into the world around us in the week ahead, we pray that you would motivate us, inspire us, uh, encourage us to be able to live for you. Uh, we pray that you would dismiss us with your grace and mercy, having come to hear and see from you even clearer today than before. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless.